Media's Mining Weekly Good. is interviewing Wislat Bayoglu, the managing director of Menar, a private investment company with a portfolio of diversified minerals that include anthracite, coal, and manganese in South Africa, gold in Kyrgyz Republic, and nickel in Turkey. Hi, Vuslat. It's great to chat to you once again. You recently signed a deal to acquire Cementco's Metalloy Smelter Complex. How far are you in finalizing the acquisition, and what plans do you have for that venture? Martin, yeah, it's an exciting project for us. We uh, signed a deal with uh, Samankor, and um, we are in the process of uh, making applications to get uh, uh, asset into our books. We need to get competition com commission approval, and we also need to get environmental license and the water use license to be ceded to us so that uh, we, we own the asset. We are hoping to close the deal by end of this year. In the meantime, we are working on, on potential solutions, like what we're going to do with the asset. Uh, the main reason why we showed interest in the in the asset is because of the readily available infrastructure, which is great. Like uh, the rail infrastructure is there, uh, land is uh, is geared up for for that um, uh, industry, and uh, that rail is critical because uh, it was receiving manganese from Northern Cape, which is a great advantage. And they were actually using like two million tons a year. It's a massive manganese amount for the for the industry, and also uh, they had the necessary licenses in place to license a new place. Is obviously very difficult, but this place has got the licenses. Obviously, it has like um, uh, because it's an historical asset. It has got like things that needs to be fixed. But uh, so far, I think Semenko did a great job like keeping it intact, keeping it in care and maintenance, not destroying the value. They closed the place in 2020 uh, because uh, the plant was old and also power uh, availability was an issue, plus the power price was an issue. We are hoping that we can either look at like building two new blast furnaces, which, which doesn't need a lot of power, uh, which needs more coke, to make sure that the reduction happens and the energy comes from the from the cock, or we may look at uh, keeping two of the latest units that was built there, and then putting a, a new technology that we are, we are talking to one of the majors who develop which developed the technology, a South African company, so that like we palletize the fines and then we can feed even low manganese content fines into the plant which actually, according to their motivation to us, is going to require less energy, which is not going to require as much as an electric arc furnace technology needs. So it's exciting for us because we are thinking that we're going to revive a project and it, it is an important like step stone for reindustrialization in South Africa. These assets are important for South Africa and we need to actually bring the uh, capacity back so that we beneficiate the product and we sell the beneficiated manganese to the world. And uh, Wislat, what is the latest regarding the underground manganese project you are working on through collaboration with ERG Africa? Because of this uh, acquisition with some anchor, it is more critical for us to be in manganese and to be more long term in the manganese. So Kongoni is an important asset for us. It's a it's a large deposit. Uh, it's underground. It's, we've got about 50 million tons of uh, manganese uh, underground, and we plan to mine the lower manganese ore body, which is about 36 to 36 and half percent manganese content. The challenge um, for uh, for developing a new underground manganese mine is the price of manganese. So price of manganese was very actually depressed for uh, for a long time, and then when the when the incident happened at South 32s manganese assets in Australia, then the price has spiked, but then it's it's coming back now to the levels that where, where it was before. So we need the right manganese price for uh, for developing Kongoni. Uh, so, so far we did everything regarding how we're going to have access to the ore, how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost us. So we did our, our feasibility, it's done, uh, but we are waiting for the right price uh, environment to push the button to start. And uh, relatively soon, we're expecting Transnet to finalize its network statement, which details how it plans to work more closely with the private sector. You've indicated in previous conversations that you support such a public-private partnership. 
How do you think the network statement will change or shape South Africa's rail reform efforts going forward? Look, um, I think uh, this rail reform is critical. Transnet is unfortunately broken, and uh, they have they have two massive issues: human capital. They actually ran a process where uh, people were voluntarily retrenched, and that actually made a, a huge uh, exodus out of out of Transnet. The, I'm talking about human capital, and obviously rolling stock issue, where the the Chinese locomotives issue has not been or resolved yet. Like the when a locomotive that was bought from Chinese company, so when it's broken, it's idled. They can't fix it. They can't get the spare parts. So that's a massive challenge. So because of that, very smartly, uh, government and uh, and Transnet decided to uh, to go ahead with the rail reform. Um, and allow third parties to have access to the rail uh, by by paying a fee. And they they published a network statement. These are all encouraging things. But what I what I want to actually um, talk about is a couple of things like what is the cost of this excess fee going to be? It's a big question mark. And how is it going to be calculated? And how would that affect the overall uh, cost of rail? Because like South, I think TFR is one of the one of the most competitive rail operators still like that with all their issues. If the cost of rail for iron ore miners or chrome miners or manganese miners or coal miners go up drastically, that's going to affect the viability of mining uh, and and exporting products out of South Africa. So that's that's critical. The other thing is obviously the sustainability of this thing. Like they're introducing something new. How is it going to be sustainable? Because there are people who are trading uh, in different commodities and they want to have access to rail. Are they going to be given a chance to to be part of this third party access? The logistics companies that they claim that they've got access to rolling stock, is, is that real? Because, I mean, are people waiting with like 500 locomotives somewhere? And then when the network, when uh, TFR decides how this rail reform is going to work, and then they will bring all those 500 locomotives and maybe 3,000, 4,000 wagons and then start working. I don't find this realistic. So I personally think that Transnet uh, should consider working with the cargo owners. So if Kumba, Asmang, Tungela, Glencore, Seriti, uh, Manor, whoever has got Sasol, Exaro, whoever has got the cargo, they should actually talk to them and they say, okay, guys, what are you going to do? Because we all know who the OEMs are and we've got long, ter- long life mines and we've got a lot to lose. But a, a trading company, when the market is bad, they don't have anything to lose. They just stop trading. But we carry on employing people. When the coal, coal price went to $40 when the COVID lockdown started, we carried on mining. But the traders said, okay, look, I mean, they've got six, seven people trading out of uh, out of wherever they are based, and then they, they stop trading. So sustainability is the, is the critical thing. And also, like, we heard that they may think about, like, on a first-come, first-serve basis. That's also very dangerous because who's coming first? The priority should be given to the cargo owners, to the mining companies, uh, which has got mines in South Africa. Duration of the the excess contract is critical. Uh, it, it should have enough duration so that we can amortize the investment, whoever is, is interested in, in investing in rolling stock. And the other thing which is important is like uh, rail and port alignment should be done. Because if you are given rail access, but then if you don't have the same duration port access on the other side, then uh, port and rail is not aligned. And uh, this can be relatively easily done in South Africa. So that's why South African ports should get the priority, like be it Richards Bay, be it Saldana, Keberha, or um, East London, Cape Town, Durban. Those ports should get the priority because those are like ports that are run by South Africans, one, two, uh, mainly transnet port terminals. So the port rail alignment is critical. I think these are the hurdles that we need to pass, but I think transnet is on the, on the right track. I think the transnet management has got the will and they've got the motivation to, to work with the industry. And I mean, we see an amazing change 
with the with the sea of transnet with the sea of transnet freight rail they are very positive and they are very collaborative to work with the industry to make a rail uh, work fantastic and, and given all the structural and economic challenges south africa has faced in recent years how do you think the country's coal industry should focus to remain competitive on a global scale especially with the rise of alternative energy sources look i mean to maintain a uh, south africa's position as a competitive coal exporter we must leverage global demand for for coal uh, particularly from the fast developing economies in asia india indian peninsula like countries um in in that area pakistan bangladesh sri lanka uh, all the asian countries are actually benefiting from these cheap reliable uh, not weather dependent source which is coal and to a certain extent they also benefit from gas so we need to leverage this because we are close to to india in terms of freight distance and india is growing at some point when china and australia had the standoff in china bought uh, product from us uh, that actually that was massive amounts of product going going to china but look with all these um, discussions that we are having regarding renewable energy battery storage hydrogen energy coal is still there the world is burning 8 billion tons of coal per year that is equal to 250 tons of coal per second 17000 tons of coal per minute and a million ton of coal per hour so in 6 hours the world burns the coal that's a that's the similar amount of building the biggest pyramid in in egypt so this is a reality and actually this this unlocks the value for wind and solar energy because fossil fuel based energy is complementary to to renewable energy this includes nuclear energy as well because at the end of the day nuclear and fossil fuel based energy are mainly creating base load so uh, the biggest increase in coal consumption is in india in 2023 it was 9% they imported 180 million tons of coal and they are forecasting that that amount is going to go to 200 million ton per annum in 2024 and 2025 so this means opportunity for south african coal miners because indian coal fired power stations mostly around the coast are burning south african coal which is like 5500 kcal per kg or 4800 kcal per kg on a net as received basis these are the qualities that they lack the the power stations are used to so it's a sad story that we have got issues with the, with our logistic challenges because at some point we were able to move 77 million ton we are back to 50 to 60 million ton per annum uh, range but we need to go back to those levels so that we can benefit from this market india burns about 1.2 billion tons of coal uh, a year like in in 2023 actually it was 1.25 billion tons i mean china burns 4 billion tons of coal they buy coal they they produce coal because it's a reliable abundant cheap and not weather dependent resource we have to accept that coal is there countries are burning coal and they're growing their economies with coal fired uh, capacity at the same time they're investing heavily to both china and india in renewables but that doesn't stop them uh, building coal fired power stations china has got more than 1200 coal fired power stations we got 15 in south africa and uh, us india they got massive amount of coal fired power stations and they become competitive because they got the cheap resource to burn uh, to produce base load so i think from a coal miners perspective coal looks quite uh, interesting uh, market is not bad at the moment yes it's not really uh, as good as like the coal prices 150 or 200 dollars it's sitting with like between 80 and 100 dollars levels depending on the quality of the coal but at the end of the day we can we can still employ our people we keep the jobs safe and we are actually motivated to bring new colors in 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 production so these are actually positive things for the coal mining industry so africa has been on the deindustrialization path for some time now how do we get things back on track so we can start seeing growth especially in key sectors like mining south africa has the experience of having these industrial uh, assets like 
Samankor's Med Alloys, Ferrochrome Smelters, Electrode Paste Production, uh, ArcelorMittal, uh, Benel, all these things are all like industrial, uh, different industries maybe, but all, all industrial assets. And uh, at some point, I think South Africa lost the focus and uh, maybe government didn't support the businesses in the way that they should have supported. Like for instance, one of the things is like cheap power or availability of power. That's the, the main reason like ferrochrome smelters stop and uh, or ferromanganese smelter stops or somebody, a South African company goes and builds another, uh, in another country, a ferromanganese smelter because they are worried about the availability of power and the, and the price of power. So I think uh, we need to go back to the planning room and say, okay, where did we make the mistakes and what should we do? Because we got the human capital and we got like young and upcoming people who are who we need to employ. I mean, kid, they're like uh, students getting graduated from university and they're sitting at home. We got 33.5% unemployment rate, 8.4 million people are sitting home and they're doing nothing. So we can't afford to have a, have an economy with so high unemployment rate. So we need to make sure that metal works. We need to make sure that cement manufacturing, cement production works because these are the basic things. We need to make sure that we beneficiate manganese and we make ferromanganese. I mean, South Africa is producing one third of the manganese or in the world, but we are only beneficiating and selling 5% of the ferromanganese to the world. But we have got the largest ores, uh, ore deposit, like manganese ore deposits in the world. Same applies to chrome. Where are we regarding ferrochrome production? Why do certain companies close the, the, the smelters? How can we solve that problem? So, you know, the, that actually goes to the power issue at the end of the day. So that's critical to produce cheap power. And we need to understand when we dollarize our power, that's dangerous. And that's why I recently questioned in, in different platforms, why are we looking at like getting gas into South Africa and burning gas compared to what we have in the ground, which is employing 100,000 people, apply the latest technologies to deal with the chimney gases and deal with the carbon dioxide sequestration and storage, but burn coal, make power cheap so that these assets that we had in the past, we bring them back, ferrochrome industry, ferromanganese industry, flourish so that we employ more people in South Africa. If you look at met alloys, they were employing 700 people. So those jobs need to be need to be back. And they were buying 2 million tons of manganese. That means 2 million tons of manganese was mined in Northern Cape, and that was employing people as well. Most probably it was employing like at least two, 3,000 people. So we need to bring these assets back. And I personally think the main issue is the availability of power and price of power. So that's critical. And obviously the second thing, which is also as important as power, is the Transnet's capability to move product to the ports or to the facilities like in the case of ArcelorMittal, they need the iron ore. In the case of as a manganese smelter, uh, they need the manganese to be to be railed so that it becomes cost competitive. That was Kino Media's Mining Weekly, speaking to Vuslat Bayoglu, the managing director of MENAR, a private investment company with a portfolio of diversified minerals that include anthracite, coal, manganese in South Africa, gold in Kyrgyz Republic, and nickel in Turkey.